Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture, and our topic today is the Supreme Court. Uh, particularly two decisions made in this last term which deal with, on the one hand, uh, legislation that's become known in the, pop, in the public square as Obamacare, and then secondly, the decision on same-sex marriage, legalizing same-sex marriage across the country. So we're going to take these cases two at a time. I have two very distinguished guests with me in the studio and over Skype uh, with me today to discuss this. Uh, Judge Roland von Brookhoven is coming to us from his, uh, from his study in his home over Skype, and we're pleased to have the judge with us. Welcome, Judge. Thank you, Daryl. And then uh, Jeff Mateer, who is general counsel at uh, the Liberty Institute, and they do a lot of legal work in the area of religious liberty. So they're keeping up with this material and getting lots of phone calls and traveling the country, getting up to speed with what's going on. So we could hardly have two better qualified guests to discuss the topics that we're going to deal with. And some of what we're going to deal with will be fairly technical legal discussion, but that's so that we can get our hands around what's actually happening at the legal level in the courts. Uh, so all of us have been reading uh, legal briefs lately, uh, and so uh, that's how we're going to begin. So we're going to start with uh, the Burwell case, which is the uh, which is the Obamacare case, and uh, Judge, I think I'll let you summarize for us uh, uh, what that decision uh, was adjudicating and how it was resolved by the court. Okay, thanks. Uh, in uh, uh, King versus Burwell, it is the latest in a line of decisions in which the Obamacare has come under attack. Uh, specifically in King v. Burwell, uh, 36 states or 37 states had not established their own exchanges, and uh, 12 had uh, established exchanges in those that did not, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, attempted to establish exchanges. Now, part of the reason for this was in the earlier attacks uh, against the statute, uh, the Supreme Court had ruled out the expansion of uh, Medicare, as I recall. And so uh, the Supreme Court had defined the term uh, mandate and penalty to mean tax. And uh, they ended up upholding the constitutionality of Obamacare. The second case is, to a certain extent, related to that because essentially the losers in that case continue to litigate the question of uh, the subsidies. And under the law, uh, subsidies uh, were granted to uh, those enrollees uh, in Obamacare under, as the language of the statute provided, uh, exchanges or marketplaces established by the states. And the IRS ended up granting subsidies to essentially everyone. And so the question there was whether the words exchanges by the states meant anything. By way of just a little background, and I don't want to get too far off here, the the statute itself is about 2,500 pages long, and there was a lot of wheeling and dealing between the White House and the Democrats in Congress over what would be included in the statute. And part of the wheeling and dealing uh, at the time was to encourage states that objected to the mandate uh, to be excluded from the subsidy provisions. And, and that is kind of where the language came in, which Justice Scalia focused in on, and many of the lawyers which I have dealt with uh, 
here in Washington have said the language says what it does. So the question before the court was, does the language which says subsidies are authorized to exchange those enrollees, which have enrolled under the state exchanges, applies to everyone, whether those established under the federal exchanges or the state exchanges. So the issue is a hermeneutical one, if I can try and say this in a paragraph, is a hermeneutical one in which the in which you have the language of the statute, which on the surface looks to be clear, but which the court, at least the, the decision of the court, uh, argued was ambiguous, and, and how that applies. And then the debate on the other side is, but if you look at the intent of the legislation and what it was intending to do as a whole, everything else, and they referred to what they called, I think, inartful crafting or something like that in discussing this, um, uh, that, that there, uh, I think the counter argument is there's no way the real intent of this was to really limit this to the states and to isolate people away from coverage. The whole point of the act was to make sure everybody was covered. And so that's now, see, the tension. I don't agree with that, Daryl. Okay. I think the intent of that language was to coerce the states to become a part of the Obamacare. And the language that flowed around Washington during the time the statute was initially uh, uh, issued and signed into law suggested that component of it. I see. So they wanted to try and preserve the state's rights and state choice element in this process while also trying to craft this law that theoretically would bring everybody under coverage. I, I think that's basically true. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Jeff, do you have any comment on the, on the structure of this case and, and what we're looking at here? No, I, I, I agree with both of you. I, I think essentially this is a statutory construction case, uh -huh. hermeneutical. Uh, hermeneutical. But, it, but, but, but for us in the law, we would say statutory construction. And okay. I also think it's a separation of powers case. I think that's how the Chief Justice viewed it, uh -huh. uh, as, as you've got a, a signature piece of legislation by, by the president, mm -hmm. passed by the Congress. And and they went out of their way to save it. Uh -huh. I, mean, I think in the end that that's what it is, and uh -huh. they used statutory construction in order to do it. But but I think, and, and I think the judge would agree. I think Justice Scalia probably has the better day and the uh -huh. better argument. Uh -huh. But at the end, he didn't have the votes. Interesting. Uh, now, uh, when we talk about statutory construction, then we're talking about it's a debate about how this statute is actually worded. Is that what you mean by statutory? Yeah, I mean, construction? It, and, and as the judge noted, established by the state. Right. That, that's, right. That's the key phrase. Right. Right. What does that phrase mean? Right. Justice Scalia would say it means established by the state. Right. Uh, not. Uh, you know, to save it in order to that if a state didn't establish it, you still qualify for an individual tax. Yeah. Credit. Now the Chief Justice wrote this opinion, and uh, which which uh, came out uh, in a way that that preserved Obamacare. Um, and basically, his argument was is that is that seen in light of the entire entirety of the statute and the intent of the statute. Um, uh, this was uh, it, it was clear that if you if you worked it the way the statute was written, you wouldn't accomplish what the statute as a whole was seeking to accomplish. Isn't that fundamentally what he was arguing? Yeah, and the, and and the response on the part of Scalia was that's not an excuse for rewriting the statute. Uh huh. And 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 I I think basically what happens is. Uh, we are dealing with statutory construction, and as was just said, a separation of powers. But it's not just separation of powers horizontally at the federal level. It's a separation of powers between the central government and the states. Okay, and then the decision itself ended up being a dispute about what right the court has to, to, to fix poor writing of, of a piece of legislation. Isn't that right? I, I, I think that's right. And those of us that have been judges have said that's not our prerogative. Uh, I see. We read the statute as it's written. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, uh, I'm not going to get lost in the details of this because uh, obviously um, it, I, I, as I've 
as we have corresponded about this, I've said this is going to be a wonderful illustration, even in a theological hermeneutics class for hermeneutics. I mean, the, the all the argumentation to and fro. If we changed uh, the legislation from Obamacare to the way certain passages are put together and debated for what they mean, we would be in very similar uh, discussions in terms of how to deal with the whole versus the parts and those kinds of questions. It's an interesting uh, hermeneutical exercise. Unfortunately, not most people are not hermeneutics and don't care to be. So uh, so as a result, I'm not sure how much uh, more there is to say on it. But the core of this is basically, it, this was a very technical uh, legal case in terms of uh, the separation of powers and making sense out of this statute. Is that right? Well, uh, I, I, I would say that those that favored the result would argue that that was what it was all about. Uh-huh. Those of us that favor the use of language and its plain meaning would argue that words mean something, both as written and in the context in which they're written. And so what you have here is a subsidy provision in the authority of the Secretary of Health and Human uh, Welfare, uh, Health and Human Services, is under one complete section of the statute, and then the authority to establish exchange, exchanges and the subsidy language is under a completely different section. Interesting. Uh, let me ask, I, this practical question came to me, this may be a silly question, and it's a question of someone who's obviously a layperson, but when, when you're adjudicating uh, the writing of a statute like this, does anyone sit down and interview the people who wrote the legislation? Does that become a part of this process at all, and why or why not? It, 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 it doesn't, at least not, in, in the sense of you sit down and find out, for instance, call the person who, who drafted it. But you can look at legislative history to make a determination. However, you don't jump, and I think this is what Justice Scalia would say, you don't jump to intent mm -hmm. until there's a conflict. You can't read the language. And in, in contract law, for instance, if, if a provision in a contract is clear, mm -hmm. that, then you don't go to what the parties intended. You, just, you enforce, as the judge said, you enforce the language as written. And that's really, I mean, I think when you look at the six Supreme Court judges, the language is clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, established by the state means something. We mm -hmm. can read it and look at it. However, the judges here looked at it and said, well, it can't mean what it says. Therefore, we're going to figure out what it means and we're going to save this statute. Yeah. The, the, I tell you the reason why I ask that question is because, in at least in philosophical hermeneutics and theology, um, there's a lot of discussion about intent, that words aren't independent of one another. They aren't even independent of a context. They come from a mind and someone produces that language and they produce that language to express a certain intent. That's the, that's the word we use. And so uh, it seems like to me uh, at least a prop part of the process of this particular discussion would be to say, what was it, legislators, you actually intended by this language and to actually force that out. Now, if in the midst of that discussion you find that the, the phrase was intended and, and utilized in a variety of ways that people signed on to it, that becomes part of your of your pot to assess, if I can say it that way. But if you're actually able to resolve that question, doesn't that re help resolve the, lang the linguistic question and the hermeneutical question that you're going after? Is there, is there a legal reason for not going there, I guess, is what I'm asking? I, I, I guess I would say since I graduated from law school, where we looked at legislative intent differently than we do now. Uh, basically, and, and you've got a problem with whether a contract is written by a committee or a statute is written by a legislature versus a single individual. How do you determine that intent? And when I graduated from Congress, I mean from law school, we, we tended to look at what the legislative intent was by looking at the, the history of, of the law. That has moved over the years toward a more adherence to what we would call the plain meaning rule, where you look at the language and you don't even get into the question of legislative intent unless there's an ambiguity. And, and, you, and you still have problems. And I think what Scalia would argue and what the arguments I've heard around Washington before this case was issued, as well as since it was issued, was there was no ambiguity. That the language stood as it did very clearly. And I, I think the, the problem with the Chief Justice's 
uh, decision was he recognized that without this language, it could cause the, quote, death spiral, mm-hmm. where the, the, the law would fall apart. And so he was trying to uh, save the law. That's not the purpose of the Supreme Court or of any judicial decisions. Yeah, and that's the problem I have. I, I see, and I and I and I get it. This this like I say, this echoes conversations we have in our theological hermeneutics classes, in which do you uh, do you interpret the line in relationship to what it says, and should it be in tension with with the with the larger piece of what you're dealing with, then how do you adjudicate that problem? Uh, and, uh, and, and, and my sense is, in reading the Ch- Chief Justice, he says, in fact, I think, I think most uh, – the Chief Justice says that the plain meaning argument is a, is a strong argument. I mean, he, he re- acknowledges that. Uh, but then he goes along to say, in effect, who would construct a law that would have this possibility within it in which in which there are some people who are not covered who, when the intent of the law was to make sure everybody was covered? I think that's how he's seeing it. Yeah, and I, I, I think basically what he ignored was at least what seemed to be surrounding the law at the time was the coercive effect of writing it this way to make sure that uh, everybody got the subsidy without regard to whether they were in a, uh, enrolled under a state exchange or under a federal exchange. Now, this raises another question that, that's not related to the decision, but I think may be another part of the piece of the puzzle that we're dealing with here in, in the practicality of this particular case. And that is, um, had this decision gone the other way, had, had, had Scalia prevailed and the statute was left as written so that only the state exchanges would have been operative in terms of offering uh, subsidy, um, then we would – the only way to fix the legislation in terms of the long-term atten- uh, uh, intent would have been to redraft the legislation in the legislature, in, in the Congress. Um, and don't you think the, that those who were – who who played with the language, if I can say it that way, um, uh, said, well, given what we've, we're dealing with today and the kind of Congress that we have, et cetera, that would be a mess as well. None of that was said, okay, but my sense is that's floating around in the background somewhere, isn't it? Oh, I think it was, but, but I don't think that's an excuse. Yeah. I mean, just yeah, because I, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that – uh, I, I was at a uh, forum Thursday at Georgetown University, and Ken Starr talked about the conversation that exists between uh, the courts and the Congress. And, and essentially, if, if the court had come down with the way it, uh, Scalia thought it should and the way a lot of the writers I read thought it should, basically – at that point, Congress was already trying to think of a fix that would avoid the death spiral, that would avoid the problems in their own congressional districts on allowing people to uh, enroll. And so it's essentially what happened when the court decided the way it did is it cut off that conversation and and it congress no longer had a possibility not of rewriting the whole statute but of simply dealing with the subsidy question interesting you know now there's an irony in this and i'm going to transition now to the other case because i think this is the irony is that what, what in effect i'm hearing you say is is that in both of these decisions a similar thing was done in that there was there's a democratic process and a structure of the way our government's designed to operate and the justices uh, for whatever reasons they, they chose to do, exercise their power in such a way that the normal way these structures should work were precluded from working and the justices in effect made a, if I can use a phrase probably not technically correct, made a summary judgment uh, on behalf of, uh, of uh, and out of some degree of practicality, if I can say it that way, put that in quotes, um, the way they were reading the situation. And thus in both instances, and the Chief Justice was on, on – on different sides in this case, in these two cases. And in, but, but in both instances, what the justices did was to take on a responsibility that, technically speaking, might not have been theirs. Fair enough? Fair. That's fair. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, okay. Well, let's transition now to the uh, to the other case. This is Obergefell versus Hodges, among others. This is actually a grouping together, I think, of several cases related to same-sex marriage, and we are resuming a discussion we had. Um, I think when the Windsor case came down, I think that's the right name. Right. Uh, when uh, when there was a recognition of of the right of same sex marriage, and in his dissent, Justice Scalia uh, made the point of uh, we're going to come back to this. Uh, we're going to come back to this, and you're going to see down the road a case that forces. Um, Forces all the states kind of into the same situation. Uh, I mean, he, and I don't, I don't think he had to be much of a prophet to make that statement. I think that you could see the direction that things were going, and uh, and this is what was happening at a legal level. Um, and so, what I want to do in, in talking about this case is to actually look at the decision itself. Um, which was written by Justice Kennedy, and look at the four premises for arguing that same-sex marriage comes under the protection of the 14th Amendment. But to do that first, probably it would be a good idea, Jeff, if you would help us with uh, telling us what the 14th Amendment is so that people understand why we're connecting it to this. Yeah, the, the four, 14th Amendment is is a series of three amendments passed after the Civil War. It's mm -hmm. called, they're called the Civil War Amendments. That They were clearly the, the purpose of the framers of the 14th Amendment were to eradicate slavery and its effects. So mm -hmm. the 13th out, out, outlawed um, uh, slavery and the 14th then guaranteed two things, mm -hmm. due process rights mm -hmm. and equal protection of the laws. Okay. And, and through the years, uh, the 14th Amendment has been expanded to uh, find what, what's so-called fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. In the past, the court has interpreted those fundamental rights as having some sort of historical uh, basis. Mm -hmm. uh, Obergefell go goes beyond that, mm -hmm. and because the, even Justice Kennedy recognizes in his majority opinion, again a five-four decision, mm -hmm. uh, that 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 historically for millennia th th this right has not been there. But mm -hmm. all of a sudden now, as of June 26th, there is now a fundamental Fundamental right pursuant to the 14th Amendment mm -hmm. to both clauses, due process and equal protection, that all states have to recognize marriage licenses of same sex couples. So, uh, and previously this has been, ex it started with slavery, but didn't it uh, come to, uh, did, was the woman's right to vote brought under the 14th Amendment? Or no, what, what, what else? actually, no, under the 14th, there's actually a constitutional Amendment, amendment for the four women's rights. For, 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 for women's rights. I mean, the, the big issue being in Roe versus Wade, okay. a, a, abortion, right to contraception before that. Okay. Um, you found these so called privacy rights. Okay. Uh, also in Lawrence versus Texas, also, uh, authored by Justice Kennedy, a, a, a right to engage in homosexual conduct. Mm -hmm. Windsor, of course, follows that, and this is sort of the, the, the third okay. case in that line. So, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at the premises, and I'm reading directly from the decision here, and for those of you who care to look it up and to be sure that I'm being uh, fair and just on this, I'm on page three of the decision by Kennedy. This is what he says. He says, the first promise uh, well, let me back up. Four principles and traditions demonstrate that uh, the reasons marriage is fundamental under the Constitution uh, that that yeah the reasons marriage is fundamental under the Constitution apply with equal force to same-sex couples. So here we go, and I'm I'm going to list out the four, and then we can talk about them as a group. The first premise of this court's relevant precedence is that the right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of individual autonomy. This abiding connection between marriage and liberty is why loving invalidated interracial marriage bans under the Due Process Clause. So that's the first one. Second principle in this jur court's jurisdiction is that the right to marry is fundamental because it supports a two-person union unlike any other in its importance uh, to the committed individuals. And then he talks about the legal basis for that. Third, a third basis for protecting the right to marry is that it safeguards children and families and thus draws meaning from related rights of childbearing, procreation, and education. We'll come back to that one. And then fourth, finally, this court, uh, finally, this court's cases in the nation's traditions make clear that marriage is a keystone of the nation's social order. And then it goes on to talk about how the state has supported that. So, um, uh, 
Now, the last paragraph in this section reads as follows. The limitation of marriage to opposite sex couples may long have seemed natural and just, but its inconsistency with the central meaning of the fundamental right to marry is now manifest. Okay, so that's that's Justice Kennedy. And now I'm going to play my theologian card. I'm a theologian, not a lawyer. Okay, so I'm going to let the lawyer speak to the four premises. Who wants to go first? There's no law in any of these four premises. <laughs> okay. So, so you're capable of speaking on them as you want. Okay. Uh, th there, there is just simply no rationale. And if we go back to the Burwell uh, King case, mm -hmm. I argued in, in, in a blog post on that one that what we were dealing with in Obergefell is, is a matter of definition. We weren't even talking about rights. And what happened significantly in Obergefell was he changed the entire definition of marriage, which by his own admission had existed for many millennia and across many uh, civilizations. So, so you've got a language problem to start with. And what is interesting is that the Chief Justice has problems with this, and he had problems in a uh, Arizona legislative case that defined legislature, but he had no problems in King versus Burwell changing the meaning of the language. So, I, but but my sense is that if if you go back to, for example, the the Casey case, which was uh, an abortion case, Justice Kennedy talked about dignity and personal autonomy, and he picks up those two themes here. He's not talking about law; he's talking about autonomy and personal dignity, and to a certain extent, that harks back to how he ties them to the right of privacy that was just mentioned. Yeah, we're going to work through these a little bit one at a time in just a second. Uh, uh, I want to get Jeff's comments first, and then and then I do want to work through them, because I have comments I want to make on the first and the fourth points. So. Yeah, I mean, and we can start with the first. I mean, I think the, the, the first is interesting, because he talks about the right. The right to personal choice regarding marriage is inherent in the concept of, of individual autonomy. As the judge no, noted, no, no sites. To, mm -hmm. to, to legal precedent. Right. Uh, that should be the first clue that, that, that something's amiss here. Uh, the second thing is marriage in this country, in the United States, has historically been a state issue. Mm -hmm. And so when right. he talks about marriage being in her and, and he, you know, bringing it now that it's some sort of federal right, that's really contrary to 200 years of constitutional law. And mm -hmm. so it, 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 he's mistaken in that. And then, of course, they throw out and, 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 and you go to, you throw out the, the Loving case, which had to deal with uh, interracial marriage. Right. But again, that was race. The, mm -hmm. the reasons for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were to eradicate racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. It made sense that, that the court in Loving versus U.S. used those to strike down a racial discrimination case. Mm -hmm. There's none of that here. And so I, I think on the first one, I think it, it, it's just incorrect constitutionally to say that somehow that there's a right to marriage somewhere was lurking in, in, in the 14th Amendment. So don't forget, this Supreme Court case overruled another Supreme Court case from the 1970s that said there was no right to same-sex marriage. Yes. Yeah, and not only that, it also contradicted – I'm glad you brought up states' rights, because in the earlier decision, which was the Windsor decision, there was an effort to preserve states' rights in that decision, which this decision now overturns. Um, uh, again, uh, just to make this clear, because we're trying to we're trying to get people to understand all that's involved here, there is a practicality that the justices are wrestling with here that that is a, a genuine real problem, and it's this: you've got certain states recognizing same-sex marriage. Uh, and then those couples move to states where same-sex marriage is illegal and those kinds of things. What do you do with the unevenness in our laws? That's really – that's probably why this case made it to the Supreme Court. Is that – or an, an aspect of why it made well, it to the Well, I Supreme think it's Court. an aspect. I mean, here you had uh, – uh, you had the Sixth – you had the Sixth Circuit going contrary to other circuits, mm -hmm. which is the classic Supreme uh, – so classic circuit split, which causes a Supreme Court case. But there are other issues in which some – 
laws are treated differently mm. in, in different jurisdictions. The state of Colorado has legalized marijuana. Does that mean all the states have to legalize marijuana? Of course not. I mean, that the states, our founders viewed the states as a place for, for, for experimentation. Mm -hmm. So the court asked two questions in, in Oberfell. It mm -hmm. really answers only one and therefore answers the second. The first one, does the 14th Amendment require all states to license same sex? Mm -hmm. The second question, which they could have said no to that and answered the second was, does a state have to recognize another state's uh, issuing of a marriage license between same sex couples? I mean. The court could have said it's not a fundamental right, but under full faith and fair credit, states are going to have to accept. Now that that raises an issue that that I think can get lost. That's important, and that is that the, before this decision was made, I think in back of my head there were three possible scenarios for how this decision could have been made. Recognizing that the likelihood was is that some type of pro same sex marriage decision was coming down the pike, and and. Uh, I, two of those options, I don't remember the details on them now, but two of those options involve not directly linking this right to the 14th Amendment, but in some way circumscribing it um, so that you didn't have what we're going to discuss next, which is the possibility of the 14th Amendment and the First, First Amendment being in tension with one another. Uh, but that was a route the court did not take. Um, and this was the most, if I can describe it or characterize it, this was the most extensive way to make this decision, uh, given the options that were on the table as the court was running running into this. Have I got that basically right, Rollin, or am I have I have I messed that up somehow? No, I I I, I think you've got that right. The, the problem with the whole decision is any legal rationale is totally absent. Mm -hmm. So so you're 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 dealing. As, as I've said before, where a judge writes, a, a justice writes an opinion, citing primarily earlier opinions that he has written, and uh, it's kind of a lazy way to start doing your homework. Hmm. And so, you, you know, he, he goes back to the Lawrence case in Texas that decriminalized, if you will, uh, uh, homosexual activity, and then he takes the Romer case out, where he throws out a state ban or a state declaration of what marriage is, and he moves to to this area. And as Scalia said in in the Lawrence case, we've only begun to see where this is going. And so I think the problem is that there's a there's a philosophical drive, which I am not sure is libertarian in its origin, or whether it is more just interested in providing equal rights for uh, same-sex uh, couples and individuals. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. Join us next week for part two. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.